are in part 5 of our study. And we are going to talk about seventh way of how to overcome the scene of discontentment. And we can overcome the scene of discontentment by stopping to compare ourselves and our lives with others. You might be surprised, but that thing that you covet or desire and wish you had in another woman's life might be making that other woman miserable when you think it might make you happy if only you had it. The biggest house that your friend has and you think that it can make you happy might enslave you to constantly needing to take care of it and the stressful burden of high mortgage and your husband constantly being away and working to provide for that house. And that journey of skyrocketing and satisfying career your friend has might enslave you in the future as you become a workaholic and will be forced to abandon your children to a cold and heartless institution of daycare. Grass is not green on the other side, and the life and family that you have now is where the Lord wants you to serve Him and bring Him the ultimate glory. You will not be able to fully do, do this working for a corporation or another man rather than your husband. If you're married, you were created to be your husband's helper, not another man's helper. Eighth, embrace the Lord's providence in your life. And by embracing the Lord's providence in life, you will be able to overcome the sin of discontentment, obviously. You are not in control of your life and are not free to use God's provision in your life without His guidance. And everything you have is not your own. You're just a steward, which means overseer and manager of God's blessings. And study Luke 16, and that will really, really give you an incredible understanding of what it truly means to be an overseer of God's blessings in your life. The Lord is the one who satisfies your life and gives you everything pertaining to life and godliness. One day you will have an account, you will have to give an account for your stewardship and the way you ma managed and oversaw his possessions, including your life, including the children he has entrusted you, including your service towards your husband, your home if you have one, or little bungalow or little hut that you live in, your body, your time, everything. You will have your financial, of course, your finances, everything, your health, your wealth, everything that you have in your life, you will have to give an account for because it's not yours. You're just an overseer. You're just a manager. Um, and a question arises, what do we have that we haven't received? And the answer is, of course, absolutely nothing. Everything that we have, we have received from the Lord. In Him, you lack nothing. In Him you live and move and have your being. In Him. He is your source of life. You need to humbly embrace your position in life, wherever you're rich or poor, and not provoke the Lord to anger by complaining. In Proverbs 22, 22 two states, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. It talks about that the Lord is the one who chooses or predestines or establishes, establishes our positions in life. He is the one who gives us favor in life. Proverbs 28.6 Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness, which means, means moral innocence, than he that is perverse, perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Remember that you are what you are only by the grace of God and, and thanks to His favor upon your life. Ninth way of how we can overcome the, way, the sin of discontentment. We should elim, illuminate, eliminate sorry, the idle time in our lives. And this is just a crucial, crucial way to quench that sin in our life and destroy it altogether. Eliminate 
idle time, get rid of idle time. Being idle can easily lead you to discontentment because you feel like you're not accomplishing anything with your life and your life is not going anywhere. Idle time leads you to discontentment and later leads you to even more sin. Remember da David, who in the moment of idleness lasted after another woman's life and it brought disaster into his life. Godly woman does not eat the bread of idleness, we read in Proverbs 31, 27, but ungodly one is idle and is a, is a busybody, and uh, we read about um, that in 1 Timothy 5, 13. This is a line of separation between the godly and ungodly woman. Ungodly woman is a busybody and is idle. Godly woman is not idle. She's busy at home. She's a worker at home, a homemaker. This is a line of separation between the godly and ungodly woman. Scheduling, scheduling your life leads to accomplishing things for God's glory, glorifying Him with good works that He has predestined for you to do. And, um, and the sense of bringing glory to the Lord through your accomplishment eliminates discontentment. How can you be discontent if you know you just brought glory to the Lord by what you have accomplished? Also, learning to rest in the Lord creates a heart of contentment. And that is a very important uh, note here. Not, of course, obviously we gain contentment from just constantly doing, doing something. No, of course not. But just resting in the Lord, waiting upon Him, and learning how to wait upon Him creates a heart of contentment. Psalm 37, rest, which means hold peace, be still in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. So please, my sister, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not take the matters in your hand, please, I beg you, do not take the matters in your hand. Let the Lord move in his perfect timing in your life. Um, way tense how we can overcome the sin of discontentment. Be an example of contentment, an apostle of contentment, I would even should say. Spread it everywhere. <laughs> a content woman is a God-fearing woman. She fears the Lord enough to understand that she is sufficient in him and is satisfied with his provision in her life. She will never blaspheme God's name by complaining, murmuring, grumbling, and being discontent, being a dripping faucet. She fears to bring his displeasure into her life and the life of her family, and remembers Miriam's example. She wants her life before others to be a testimony of God's all-sufficiency and His abundant provision. And I mentioned that, but I just want to stress it again. That's all I desire in my life. I want my life to be a testimony of God's abundant provision and His all-sufficiency. Even if I just have bread on my table, He has provided. He has. And that's all we need. The godly woman, who is an example of contentment, an apostle of contentment, she spreads it everywhere she goes, she boasts in God. And ask yourself a question, and I'm asking myself this question also. When have you boasted in God last time? When have you boasted in God last time? I love uh, when I hear sisters boasting in the Lord. It brings such glory to Him. They always have a special glow shining upon their faces. And in Psalm 44, 8, we read, In God we boast all day long and praise thy name forever. And that, that word boast means to shine, make show, to rave. And I think that answers the question or, you know, behind why those ladies that boast in the Lord, they're constantly shining, smiling, bubbling. Because this word to boast means to shine. It brings a special glow. <laughs> you know, you will not need blush. You will not need sparkles on your face. Because you will just be glowing. Because you're boasting in the Lord and in His goodness in your life. So this concludes our part five of our study. I hope you profited from it.